Hello, Bechdel Theatre podcast listeners. It's Pippa here in the post-production edit. Now, before we begin our second episode, which was recorded live at the Vault Festival in Waterloo, I just want to introduce you to what the Bechdel test is, in case you don't know. The test was originally created by a woman called Alison Bechdel in the 80s, with her now-famous comic strip, Dykes to Watch Out For. It was originally part of a discussion about movies, and for a film to pass the test, um, it had to feature at least two women who talk to each other about something other than a man. Um, For us, it's been a really brilliant springboard to talk about how women are represented, but this time, theatre is under the spotlight. And yes, that was a theatre pun. (laughs) Uh, I really hope you enjoy this special episode, and please stick around to the end, because we invite our audience to tell us about some of their favourite inspirational feminists, and we give you some upcoming theatre recommendations. So now, on to the show. Welcome to the Bechdel Theatre Podcast live at Vault Festival. Uh, I'm Pippa. And I'm Beth. And And uh, we're your hosts. hosts. So this is a very special episode, not only because it is live with a real audience. Hello, audience. Hi. <laughs> For the but people listening at home, there's about 300 people uh, sitting in this theatre. With we're us. in a stadium <laughs> of feminists. It's wonderful. Um, but also, we have three really special guests. Three brilliant, phenomenal women, all creators and campaigners. Uh, so I'll introduce them to you. This is Bella Heeson. Hello. Anything you'd like to say about yourself, Bella? Uh, sure. <laughs> I'm an actor, writer and theatre maker. And I have a show on at Vault Festival called My World Has Exploded a Little Bit. Uh, It's my debut piece as a writer. It did really well at Edinburgh Fringe this last summer. Uh, People were laughing and crying and hugging me. And we're on next It was awesome. Go and see it. Um, And then we've got Georgina. Georgina on the end. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Georgina, Georgina Bob. Um, I'm a television production coordinator, so I work freelance. Um, I also run my own company called TV Jobs UK, which essentially is an employability business where I train people who want to work in the television industry how to get into the industry, essentially. And I'm also a bipolar activist. I have bipolar and I'm very passionate about mental health issues as well. And finally, Lakani Chua. Yeah, my name's Lakani. Um, I'm also an actor and performer. Um, I also do another podcast um, called The Creative Juice Podcast, um, so you should all check that out. Um, Yeah, and I'm also performing in the Actors Jam um, this month now, uh, on the 18th of February, so yeah, check it out. Lovely. Um, So this week, uh, we went to go see some Bechdel test passing fringe shows here at the Vaults, and a very sparkly Western musical. Um, So in a bit, we'll be talking about those. Uh, Plus, we'll be taking recommendations from our lovely audience here on their feminist faves, films and TV shows, as well as plays, and talking about some of our personal heroes. But first, as she has to run off in a minute to Oval House for the launch of their new season, we'll talk more more about that later. Uh, This is Bella, who's going to tell us a bit more about the show she's staging at The Vault. Can you tell us, Bella, how you came up with this idea of making a show about your parents dying? Uh, So the primary inspiration was my parents died and um, I was already a creative and an actor and I'd previously used writing in a kind of cathartic way um, to just work through my feelings in private. So I started off like that and then I started to think this would make quite a good play. So I approached a director friend of mine called Donna Crobrian who is a brilliant director and dramaturg and he helped me develop the piece. So um, it started off as quite a kind of poetic monologue and then turned into this crazy performance lecture where I tell the audience they're going to die and tell them how to cope with it and the steps they should go through and I play this kind of hyperlogical, silly version of myself and have an assistant who sings inappropriate songs about brain tumours and <laughs> plays the piano and messes around with a portable urinal. It's great. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's really it's genius. Um, I saw it at Edinburgh and I bloody loved it. So everyone, I totally advise you to go and see it. Um, so when I was thinking about you coming onto the podcast, it then occurred to me about this logical, silly version of you that is like hyper rational, um, and about how that might be doing something to maybe challenge perceptions of women on stage. Because I 
remember this quote about from a terrible film, I can't remember, called um, As Good As It Gets, Jack Nicholson. And he says, oh, I know how to write a good female character. You just write a man and then you just take away reason and rationality. And I was like, that's not what Bella did. <laughs> no. <laughs> did you be aware of that? Um, it's funny, actually. I didn't do that on purpose. That's just who I am. Um, I, if anything... <laughs> it can be a problem. Like, my husband, I think, is more emotional than I am. And he sometimes has to explain to me if, like, we're having some kind of disagreement. He's like, so what's happening here is I'm having an emotional response, um, which is non-rational. You have to give me the time to feel the feelings, and then we can discuss the issues rationally. And I'm like this robot going, oh, okay, well, that's tedious, but I'll wait for you to feel the things, and then can we discuss the issues rationally? Um, and so that was my approach to death. To sound really pretentious, um, Plato has a theory of the soul, as being comprised of reason, feeling, and the will. Um, and he believes that reason should be dominant um, so that we keep our feelings under control, essentially. And I'd always bought into this. I'd identified with it. Like, yeah, my reason is in control, and that's great. In the face of death, that actually is of limited use. Yeah. You do yeah. sort of have to let yourself feel things <laughs> um, yeah. and just go through that. And so... The play kind of addresses that because that was my experience. I didn't set out to kind of bust any sort of images of women. But I think what's great about women creatives is that you don't have to set out to do that. You just are a three-dimensional human. And so you share your personal experiences mm -hmm. and you reveal that women are three-dimensional humans who have different and varied responses to things. Um, I think it's yeah. really... I really love kind of autobiographical work because of the way that it gives you an insight into somebody else's interior world, male or female. And I think that it's really valuable because it allows the audience to feel empathy. Um, Kate Tempest has, like, talks about this, about cultivating empathy, and I really relate to that. I think that's um, so one of the things that makes me feel like maybe making a show all about myself isn't just arrogant, but it's also worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> it's quite important. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely got important reactions from people in the audience when I saw it. Um, I should just let everyone know that Bella has a degree in philosophy from Cambridge, hence the uh, long words and Plato quotes. Um, <laughs> she's not just an actress. Um, and so you've written the show and you're performing in it, but it's a two-woman show. Yes. You've got a really distinctive and wonderful, beautiful relationship with the other woman on stage with you. Thank you, yes. Ava Alexander, she's fantastic. I was really thrilled to find her. Um, she's basically, her character is a clown, and her clown is fantastic. She's very different to me. I'm very kind of linear and logical, and she is kind of quite scatty and creative and emotional and thinks in pictures and colours and um, is in a different universe to me, <laughs> which seems full of sparkle and joy. And so she, roles. <laughs> yes, she makes the audience laugh a lot. She's wonderful. And also, uh, the man, your director. The man. <laughs> there is a man involved. Um, you've really developed the show in, like, sort of co-creation with him, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it's my story and I wrote all the words, but he was vital in terms of creating the structure of the show. Um, so when I first kind of took what I had to him, he basically gave me feedback as if we were in a rehearsal with me just as an actor, where he would say, why don't you try this? Except that that would refer to the writing as well. So he mm -hmm. went, why don't you try saying it in the third person? Um, and I was like, well, that's weird and stupid, but okay. Um, and then out of those suggestions, we came up with this idea of the lecture. Um, and then there are these other scenes with voiceover, which Ava does. So Ava's brilliant because she switches between this very silly character and these kind of lovely kind of poetic voiceovers where she plays a gorgeous live piano score, which another woman, my wonderful friend Anna O'Grady, composed for me. Um, so, yeah, he, he's brilliant. Um, and... I'm sure he's... A, I mean, he definitely is a feminist, so he's allowed. Um, oh, yeah. And, um, <laughs> he's a goodie. Yeah. <laughs> we're we're going to be working together over the next two years. We've just been named associate artists at Oval House Theatre, which is really exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Um, Oval House is great. Oval House is great. <laughs> uh, we're going to be making a couple of shows together. Um, the next one is going to be about female sexuality. Yeah. <laughs> any, any more clues about that, or is it a surprise? Well, yeah, I mean, like, it's in the early stages of development, but the key thing is that it's going to be celebrating female sexuality um, and looking at the positive side of it. I think it's really important that of late there's been a conversation um, kind of in, in the culture broadly about um, 
how some women have been having a pretty shit time mm. and um, that hasn't been acknowledged and so that's brilliant but I also think there's a risk of just getting a bit depressed and so I quite want to be like but it can be amazing pleasure is good yeah. let's seek the pleasure um, so I want to talk to lots of women and gather lots of voices to influence where I go with it. It will inevitably have an autobiographical element, um, but I'm also going to maybe use like some myth, because I've, I've read about this amazing ancient Egyptian sex goddess who stands naked on a lion, and I'm like, she's yes. got to be in it. <laughs> Sounds cool. Definitely. <laughs> so you're going to be standing on a lion in the show. <laughs> no. Um, but... So you're looking for people to talk to about sexuality? Yes, absolutely. Over the next kind of month or so, um, I'm going to be putting together an online questionnaire, which uh, hopefully you guys will kind of share for me. Yes, we um, will. So that people can fill out. speak to me anonymously. But also, if anyone would like to speak to me face to face, I'd love to just talk about sex with women. Well, I will mm. see you very soon. For <laughs> <laughs> so Bella actually has to leave us now because she's going to Oval House's opening season, as I said earlier, to be a star. Um, but quickly, before you go... Uh, all the audience have given us a tip of their feminist fave people, books, movies, theatre, whatever it is. What have you got for us? What would you recommend? So um, at Vault Festival, actually, a friend of mine called Holly Morgan from Cambridge is doing a show called Seven Crazy Bitches, which is a reworking of Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man speech, but with wigs and share. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> so, oh, my God, share. <laughs> yeah. It's a brand new show, so I haven't seen it, but I think it sounds awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, Kind of more broadly speaking, the people that have inspired me that I would recommend people look up if they don't already know um, is, uh, well, Bryony Kimmings. Um, she makes amazing work. Um, she's also someone that you should look up, actually, because she does amazing work around mental health. Sorry, oh. I'm looking to my left. No. I understand that on a podcast, people can't tell who I'm speaking to. <laughs> Georgina would love Bryony Kimmings. We love um, Bryony Kimmings. Um, and uh, Catelyn Moran, who obviously isn't theatre, but um, is a great feminist, who I find inspiring. She um, talks about kind of activism and has this image of a, a patchwork quilt where if we all work on our own square um, and don't criticise other people for the thing that they're passionate about, but just focus on the thing that we're passionate about, then everything will get dealt with. Um, and I find that a reassuring kind of touchstone. Mm -hmm. um, all of her books are great. And um, who else? I can't remember. Uh, you did I, mention her earlier, but oh, Kate Tempest. Yeah, you mentioned oh, yeah, Kate Tempest earlier. I love Kate Tempest. Um, and she's, yeah, I've, I went to a reading that she did, actually, um, about the novel that she wrote. And um, she actually said that she, she found herself writing one of her characters as a man and <laughs> then realised that there was no reason for them to be a man and so changed it into a woman. Um, so there's this woman in the book with a man's name. Um, and I, yeah, I quite, that, that kind of just ignited my imagination because obviously one of the debates in theatre and in film and TV is this idea that um, maybe people find it difficult to write, men find it difficult to write female characters and it's like, well, maybe just whatever character you've written, make it a woman um, yeah. because they are also people. So, yeah. and, um, you know, lis yeah. listen to some women around you, talk to some. <laughs> Thank you, that's brilliant. Um, so go and see Bella's show, the 8th to 12th of February at Vault and look out because we'll be tweeting the details of how to get in touch about the sex show, the sexy sex show. The sexy sex show. <laughs> yeah, I'm My world has exploded a little bit, 6 30 yeah. p.m., 8th to the 12th of February. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I was so plug. rude for leaving because I really want to listen to what these other brilliant women really are going to say. But yeah, I do have to go to this lunch because I've already committed to it. So thanks. You can listen to the rest at home. <laughs> Thank, you, <Bella. laughs> Thank you, Bella. Thank you. That was Bella Heesom, whose show My World's Exploded a Little Bit is at Vault Festival next week. Yeah, um, so apart from uh, Bella's great show, we went to see a few other performances um, at the Vault this week, um, which included Britney, I don't know if anyone here saw that, um, which was a comedy about two friends, uh, one of whom has a brain tumour, um, and that's also a uh, autobiographical work, which included lots of sketch comedy in it as well. Um, we also um, saw, the girls saw, um, Balancing Acts, a physical theatre and film fusion about how different people um, cope with depression. And um, Fran and Lenny, the story of two women in a punk band uh, together. So um, to Georgina and Beth, who saw most of them, unfortunately, mm -hmm. Lacani couldn't come with us to those um, yeah, shows. I sadly didn't. What um, stuck out to you in those shows? Um. I really liked Balancing Acts because it was really, like, in regards to sort of depression and how it was creatively communicated on the stage, 
I don't know, because it's something that I'm sort of passionate about anyway. When I was watching it, I just thought it was like really good because I don't really tend to go to theatre that often. So it was an experience for me to actually go to the theatre and actually see how mental health is portrayed. And I found it really interesting. Hmm. It was kind of physical, wasn't it? Like Yeah, like there was a lady on stage and she was like dancing and like... And they also use film as well. like Yeah, in. and film as well. And I think... Yeah, I think she, I think it was really good, yeah. And it was, uh, what I really enjoyed about that was the diversity of the voices talking about depression. So they used recordings of, like, real people that they'd interviewed. Yeah. And so to hear that, like, mental health or illness can yeah. affect people of all ages from all different backgrounds was really useful, I think. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was really good. It was a good show. I think kind of... Uh, Kind of going on from that point, maybe, especially because you work in TV and yeah. theatre is um, your medium. I wonder if theatre kind of has more of a leniency or, or more kind of um, space to do so much more like autobiographical work than, than I think film does. Yes. And I wonder... How the should... difference is between both. Yeah. Um, I thought, like, it's more about interpretation. Yeah. I think so like when you're watching like theatre and how theatre represents sort of mental health and depression and stuff it's like it's interpreted in a different way so for instance if like TV TV would make documentaries following like a character who may have depression so that would be done in a different way um, I like sort of theatre because it's very creative so you can kind of relate to some parts of it um, but I think on the whole like the show mm. was like I thought it was like one of the best sort of fringe theatre type shows that I've seen. So, well done to the team. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, Feral Foxy Ladies and Kaleido were the two companies that made that. Yeah. Uh, also, Fran and Lenny, we went to see that together, didn't we? Oh yeah, that was very um, very different to that. <laughs> yeah, full on. That was very full on. It's very about it punk. Good. So yeah, lots of music, exactly. lots of swearing. Yeah. <laughs> my favourite line from that. Did I tell you my favourite line from that? It, oh, yeah, what were you saying? It was, um, don't call my mum a cunt. Sorry, mum. <laughs> and the other one said, oh, I mean it in a nice way. I love Jill. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that. That just totally explains the kind of language of their relationship. Like, Jill is such a mum name as well. It's wonderful. Sorry if there's any Jills here. <laughs> well, they might be mums. That's not, yeah. Being a mum is not a bad thing. Yeah. Hi, mum. Um, and Brittany. And Brittany. I loved Brittany. I thought I would love to see it again it, because it was a, I mean, Fran and Lenny was probably similar and maybe also balancing acts, but um, I personally love like female comedy duos. I watch a lot of them on TV and podcasts as well. And I think I, I just love it when you can't recreate for me um, the connection and like chemistry of two best friends um, on stage. And to me, I think that's, that's something you can't fictionalise. That's something that I don't know if anyone here watches Broad City, which is kind of what I'm also thinking about, um, in terms of like being on TV. And that was two people, um, two best friends' real uh, story of their lives and how they interact. And then it got made into a TV show after its YouTube ch show. And, um, is that Broad City? That's Broad City. Not Britney. No, yeah, Broad City. Britney's Bro not TV Broad City yet. is that. But Britney is. Um, two best friends dealing with the fact that one of them developed a brain tumour who they called uh, Britney um, after Britney Spears um, <laughs> and there's loads of Britney Spears music in it as well and it's just like this brilliant uh, concoction of loads of like different sketches and the girls play like every single character and I think it's a, it was a perfect kind of um, mixture of you know absolute hilarity but also talking about something really serious. I don't know, for me, that's like my favourite kind mm. of... I feel fashion. like they probably should be on TV eventually, like as a sketch comedy duo, you know. Yeah. There aren't enough female comedy duos in the media. Maybe mm. Georgina can put a word in yeah. for well, the BBC. I work sort of for, for various independent production companies and broadcasters, and in regards to sort of a woman working within the industry behind the scenes... I think it could be looked at, at different ways in regards to sort of feminism and women generally and whether there's equality and stuff like that as well. Um, I would say that, um, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to, to explain. Well, you were talking about the panel show thing, about how there's always like one token woman in a lineup. Yeah, like yeah. for instance, behind the scenes, I think like you need to look a certain way to kind of like get a job and stuff. I wouldn't say it's that like, 
obvious, but I do think you have to have a certain look to sort of get in. There's stereotypes of different people yeah. that work in the industry. So, yeah, I would say that. Is there a lot of, like, box ticking kind of going on? Not, I would, not deliberately, right. but it goes on, mm. shall we say. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, should we talk about dream girls? <gasps> yes. <laughs> this is something I can get involved in. Yeah. I saw yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Nakani, what did you think of dream girls? I thought it was amazing. It was such a good show. And um, yeah, I was really like blown away by it. You know, when you watch something and you're literally like, you have goosebumps, but it's mainly because of the singing, because obviously it's phenomenal. And, um, but it's just a really all round good show. Um, yeah, what did I you guys think? I have never heard voice like that on stage. Yeah. Like, uh-huh. never. I mean, I haven't seen that many musicals, but, like, yeah. this was on a whole other level. For anyone who um, isn't kind of aware of Dreamgirls at the moment, um, it's starring Amber Riley, who was in Glee as a Mercedes. Um, I absolutely loved Glee when I was growing up. So, for me, yeah. that was, like, such a, like... I don't know. It was such a thing to see. Fan girl. She made us go to the stage door. (laughs) Yeah, and then I yeah I I used to have a tradition of always going to the stage door, and um, I didn't realize that it was her because she was hidden behind loads of people. Well, she she, had a cap on. She she? had a cap on that said "Slay," which (laughs) I thought was brilliant because that's exactly what she did in in the musical. And then she kind of like was walking, and then I kind of like half screamed because I didn't realize that she was standing right there, or she was the person with the sleigh cap on. And then she just kind of got ushered back into the building, so I didn't get a photo. Oh, nice sad time. We'll have to go and see it again. Who, who wants to go and see it again? Yeah, I could, I'd yeah, definitely, definitely go again. Go again. Yeah. yeah. Um, if we could afford it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's something. Oh my god, so, my glass of wine was ten pounds. You bought a yeah. glass of wine? <laughs> really? Wow. You know, you're in the theatre. Yeah. £10 for one glass of wine. One glass yeah. of wine. Wow. Is it a, I feel like large they're, they price people out. It, it was a large. It was It was a large, but yeah. it's, come on, ATG. Yeah, mine like, was like eight something. Mm. I did not expect that. I had a Diet Coke and it was £3.50. So. That is. <laughs> that, I would have brought my own Diet Coke. I'm that person. I've got my bag full of supplies. I don't care. Next yeah. time I'll have a tin. I'll have a gin and a tin. <laughs> But, yeah, no, it was uh, such a phenomenal show. I'd never seen the film. I didn't know the songs. I've never seen Glee. I didn't know Amber Riley. Mm. And I was just blown away. It was amazing. Yeah. I thought the show was spectacular. I had a bit of a cry. I cried. listened a bit. It's when they sung Listen, I had a cry because it was just something that I felt that I sort of could relate to. And there I was several was standing ovations. I thought, it was, mm. I thought it was spectacular, amazing, really good show. Um, did it pass the Batgirl test? I mean, does it matter? Uh, well, yeah. Does yeah. it matter? Well, because they talk about men a lot. They do. There's She's, a lot of men in it. That I, to be honest, con- considering this musical is called Dream Girls, right? And all you ever hear about from the film and from the show is about the women. There was like too many men in it for me. Too many like, men. Too many men. Too many men. Too many men. If you're gonna call your show Dream Girls and have it be about the story of um, women kind of overcoming obstacles and becoming famous, I just thought the story would be centered more on them. Or I didn't expect there to be so many songs by the men. Um, don't get me wrong; those men's voices were absolutely amazing. Yeah, they, they were, were so really good. good. I love listening to them, but, but I just thought they, they had were all random. the big conversations about the music production, about the like style of music, about the mm. kind of wider world, and the women kind of talked to each other. They did actually. They, the whole song "Listen" is about the two women's relationship. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's about the relationship. It's not about like. You know, and I, I suppose the, the in that shit. sense, it's really indicative of the time because men were the um, producers and women were on the stage. So there's that as well. But I, I was just, I was just actually very surprised. I thought the women could have had a lot more solos and a lot more yeah. group songs that weren't just them on stage. Mm. But in terms of kind of like representation, mm. the women were. I liked Effie. Yeah. Like, I thought her character kind of, like, was kind of a resemblance of, like, me. (laughs) 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 Because she was, like, you know, didn't fit in, but she was, like, the most talented kind of thing. (laughs) (laughs) Not not trying to blow my trumpet. Not not trying to blow my trumpet. But I don't know. Like, I just thought, in general, like, the show was just really good. And who's seen it, by the way? Who's seen it? Right, show your hands. We've got two people, two people who could afford to see Dreamgirls. <laughs> Please go and see it. Like, it is 
it's spectacular. And also in regards to diversity as well, it's like the first play or theatre production that I've seen that has sort of an uh, all-black cast. I think there's two, two, white, two white people, but it's diverse. And I just think it's spectacular and it's amazing and it's fantastic that there is so much diversity sort of in that play because, mm -hmm. you know, I just think it's just so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also, it's especially on that point, is that we need to kind of, or at least I felt walking away from it, that mm. we need to kind of bring that forward into yeah. the shows that we create yeah, today definitely. because I felt like it was very much kind of like, um, oh, there's a train going overhead. for <laughs> We're underground, we're in um, the vault. But I think that the West End maybe at the moment has a bit of a problem with kind of historicizing black identity on stage yeah. and kind of only having a, a kind of like, full black or diverse cast when it's um, something historical, which yeah, um, like, you know, yeah. should not be the case at all. No, it would be amazing to see something current, but I can't really see, I'm not really too involved in the theatre world. I'm more sort of TV. Mm -hmm. And I think TV is getting more and more diverse in front of camera, but mm, yeah. sort of behind the scenes, there are sort of systems in place to make sure that diversity is being sort of, um, counted shall we say yeah. have you watched um chewing gum with michaela yeah. cole i haven't i, I need really to watch it. That. sorry i don't watch much tv but when i do i do tend to watch like the big shows so it's like x factor and <laughs> i'm like an entertainment person um but yeah i think there should definitely be more diversity and i've heard some good things about chewing gum so yeah definitely yes. watch it it's really good yeah i will i've heard so many good things about it it's amazing. Watch it. And then also, Mich Michaela Cole is an amazing like theatre actor as well. Cool. So we can try and yeah. get, get as her much to the stage so we can go to take it all in. And just um, interestingly enough, Chewing Gum started out as a play at the National. And I feel like that's what's really important is that it started out as something quite little and was like a small show. And then it's just gone on to do so well. And I feel like it is because it's something that's so unique and different. And by obviously someone of colour, it's just important that there is that representation on screen. So, Do you want to quickly yeah. explain what Chewing Gum is? Okay, um, so Chewing Gum is a story about this girl called Tracy. Um, and it's about her life, like growing up on the estate and all that she goes through as a young black woman. Um, so like her relationships, her relationships with her mum and her sister... Um, and it's just really funny, like, it's a comedy, but it's a bit outrageous, like, you kind of have to have that sense of humour and go with it, but I think it's really, like, well done, and the second series is out, it's really good, yeah. So it's quite dramatised then, so it's like a dramatised comedy type. It's funny. Yeah, well, okay. it's just... Very funny. The mm. character's just, like, I guess you could say, like, a bit extra, but... <laughs> yeah. I, c I can okay. kind of relate sometimes, <laughs> though, and I'm not even, I don't know. Yeah. She's a bit, she's Everyone a bit has dramatic. a little bit of Tracy in them, basically. That's what I'm okay. trying to say. Actually, that's one of the things that I liked about Effie in Dreamgirls, is yeah. that she doesn't hold back. No. Like, I could relate to that in terms of, like, just fully losing her temper and mm. throwing stuff around. And, <laughs> and you just don't, re you rarely see that, like, women on stage are like, or on screen are like, sniffle, sniffle. <laughs> and Effie was like, ah! Yeah. <laughs> I think she really um, kind of, personified or maybe that term came from that time anyway but kind of thinking about like Diana Ross and like this idea of being a diva yeah was, what, what sprung to mind when I watched when I watched Dreamgirls but the like fishtail also, dresses the sequins the dresses. Oh, oh my gosh my God. the dresses were wicked oh I want oh, one so I much I love them yeah. for the dresses alone Sorry, to watch the show was making well, a serious I was point. Just, well I was just <laughs> thinking about um uh, kind of like divas, you know, Effie is a, is a, a, a brilliant husband. character, but she just didn't, she was unrelenting in her ideas of what she wanted to pursue mm -hmm. and that she wouldn't kind of change her ideas in, in any sense. And, uh, you know, she, she wanted to stick to her guns and she wanted to be, she was the most talented one of the girls, um, but kind of like the, the prettier, thinner one was the one who was going to be Who was pushed stage. forward, yeah. yeah. She was pushed forward. And so Effie decides, well, I'm not singing in the back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go. Um, so, which is kind of like the kind of ideas that I think we're led to believe that men kind of uh, hold yeah. a bit more, like very assertive, very like, I'm not going to do it any other way. But it was a bit weird that they, did, they don't ever mention that it's because she's like got a different shaped figure and a different skin colour to the girl that gets pushed into the front. They're yeah, never like, it's oh, it's because you're fatter and you're browner. Like, they never say that. They're just like, it's because of 
mm, we just think the other girl is, mm, she looks better. But it's like that in everyday society, though. Yeah. So, you know. Like the yeah. elephant in the room, like, don't mention yeah, it. Yeah, don't mention Don't mention that. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see it being tackled. Yeah, mm. I thought they were doing it's such nice. a good thing by um, having her, you know, in the end, sorry, um, <gasps> kind of, you know, be, be successful. Um, but have it not really be addressed that it's, it's because of all the features that make her different um, mm -hmm. that she has, like, overcome so much more. Mm -hmm. They kind of... She just kind of got to that point and, and never really explained, mm -hmm. explained any of that. They could have made it more explicit. It, it is always amazing to see people on a West End stage where you think, oh, to be on the West End, you have to be, like, so tall and so skinny and have a certain skin colour and a certain face shape yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And it's amazing just to see somebody kill it yeah like amber riley yeah no, definitely <laughs> yeah. yeah she did well she did well it was a good show so talking about um like we talked a bit about film tv about what's kind of my maybe lacking like you'd like to see yeah a, a modern is there anything else you want to see i would love to see as everybody knows i've got bipolar i work in tv etc etc i'm really really passionate about speaking about mental health conditions, issues, illnesses, however you want to talk about them. Um, because I think essentially everybody has their own mind and everybody goes through their own life's experiences and things affect people in different ways. Um, so it would be great for it to take priority in regards to creatively, so in theatre, in the arts and how it's represented in the arts as well. Mm. Because not everybody who has particular illnesses you know, are crazy or mad or nutter or whatever the terminology may be. I think it's about people understanding when people do act a certain way, what, why they act that certain way and yeah. how they feel when mm -hmm. they're in that position. So that's something that I'm quite passionate about and I hope to sort of champion the fact that just because you have something, whether it's depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, personality disorder, whatever it may be, you know, you can achieve, you can do something with your life and you are essentially mm. normal and it shouldn't define you. Yeah. And I think that's what, you know, it so should would you, be. So would you like to see things where people just have a mental health condition or illness or whatever yeah. it is, but it's not about that? Like the play's not... Yeah, it could be or just the a general... It could that. be like a general play thing. about anything, but it would be good to have little just like it being shown in the media or shown in sort of theatre productions where it's highlighted like, okay, this person has this, but it's like, they're fine, you know? Yeah. yeah. Do you well, know what we I were mean? saying? It's like, you don't want it to be that um, you are the mental illness as yeah. such. And I feel like there's too much of that, like, oh, yeah. So it just needs to be less about that and more about something else and how you can overcome it or whatever. Yeah, totally. I think that's really important. I think 100%. that kind of happens in kind of any minority aspect that you are. Yeah. The stories are centered around kind of how you're a minority. Mm -hmm. So like, for instance, yeah. if, in, in any sense, whether it's your race, your um, sexuality, your gender identity, the stories that we're seeing are coming to the forefront, but it's so often about, um, you know, if you're a lesbian, it's about coming out for the first time. It's not that it, you're, you have your identity and you happen to also be a lesbian. It's always a story about... Um, you discovering your sexuality for the first time, so it's amazing that those stories are being told. But like, I think this, we're getting to that point in film and theatre and TV that we kind of need to move past those yeah. storylines, especially as, as move well. Move past the label, basically. Yeah, the label, the yeah. stereotyping, definitely, a hundred percent, something I'm very passionate about, and I can speak about it for ages. I was also on the BBC News um, channel and BBC Two speaking about living with bipolar disorder. As well, I don't know if you guys checked it out, but it's on online. If if you Google me, you'll see it. But um, yeah, I spoke a lot about that as well. So mm, we'll check that out. Is there yeah. anything that you'd recommend that is you know is happening or like you're working on at the moment? Or um, I can't really talk about anything that I'm working okay. on in particular to my contract with the um, television production company that I'm working for at the moment because that's something that I can't really talk about. But um, I'm working on sort of comedy entertainment stuff, 
Um, I've got my own sort of project that I'm trying to get off the ground, but it's because I'm so busy doing loads of other things. It's literally just like, okay, when I've got the time. And um, that's based on mental health. Um, and I'd like to do more speaking engagements around mental health generally and mm. the creative industries because I feel that a lot of people suffer in silence. <clears throat> and I think that, you know, essentially, you know, it should be the forefront because, you know, mentality is your reality. It's mm. real. <laughs> I feel like I want to, like, t take you to see all of the plays about mental health. I can yeah. think of... Please do. There's um, also, actually, on BBC Three, there's a documentary. I don't know if it'll still be online on the iPlayer called Being Black and Going Crazy. That's really oh, good. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's a good insight to what it's like for people in the black community to suffer from mental health and try and actually communicate that with anyone that they know because there's a lot of stigma around it. I feel totally. like generally it can be a lot more accepted in other communities. There's a real thing about God and all of that in the black community. So against like mental health, yeah. And how you can just pray to get better and all of that, which oh, is wow. a bit, ah, yeah. Wow. So watch that, that's really good. <laughs> so that's good. Good, cool. good recommendations, ladies. Yay. Do you um, got anything you're looking forward to this year? I'm looking forward to listening to more podcasts. I've really got yeah. into podcasts <laughs> recently. Yeah. Like, mm. weird, huh? Yeah. Uh, I started doing one and I'm like, oh, maybe I should find out what other people are up to. Mm. Um, the podcasts I'm really loving at the moment. Yeah. Sophie Hagen's Made of Human podcast, which actually talks, I recommended it to you, Georgina. Yeah. She talks a lot about mental health but also about sexuality about gender mm. about just like random stuff it's about um it's called made of human because it's about like how to cope with being a human like how we do human um and uh, she's had some brilliant guests on she had uh, richard gad on who had a brilliant show about his own it was about mental health but also about sexuality he had he went to a therapist and then um came out as bisexual like because of past events that happened I won't spoil the show um but yeah that, that one didn't pass the Bechdel test but um the, the she had an amazing episode with um her name Bethany Rutter who's a um like fat positive body positivity campaigner and she was awesome um also uh Melanin Millennials is a yeah, really good podcast I've listened to that that's listened a good that. one yeah I, well. I, I was looking for the British two dope queens because I was listening to that and talking American accent and I was like I've got to stop so I started listening to Melanin yeah. Millennials. Mm. Yeah, yes. so they're my top ones. And also campaigns-wise, like Serious Serious, was, is the 50-50 Parliament campaign that are active and working really, really hard to get more um, balanced representation of gender in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So check that out, 50-50 okay. Parliament, Made of Human yeah. podcast. Um, okay. wow. Melanin Millennials. Everyone's so cultured. <laughs> <laughs> you just make our culture for us. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Regina. It's okay. Um, what do you want to see from 2017, Pippa? Um, oh God, so much. You said um, something earlier. What was I saying earlier? Oh, yeah. I have oh, a few yeah. things that I want to see this year. I Maybe someone can help me out, because I've never seen this on stage before, and I would just really like to see it. And I either have to wait for someone to do it, or I may have to figure out a way of doing it myself. Um, but I'm really interested in uh, menstruation as a topic, and I personally would love to see uh, menstruation blood on stage because I've never seen that before. So I'd like to see. She that. means real, not like pe fake blood, why? not stage blood. No, she means the real no, deal. Why? Because why not? It's a part. It's like. <laughs> Oh I my I god! Said this to you. <laughs> That's like I need to tell you to see level. some uh, Hands live up. up in the audience if you'd like to go and see a show. Oh, no, no one's going to put that with up. real menstruation blood. No. Oh, one, two, oh, great. Three. Okay. More people than have seen Dream <laughs> Girls. Than we've seen. Oh, oh, that's the wine I just going. The wine <laughs> More people than have seen Dream Girls in this room would like to see a show with live menstruation blood. There you go, Pippa. Well, I'll uh, be on. asking for donations. Uh, <laughs> Crowdfunder. <laughs> No, that was just something that I've been thinking about that uh, I think is still an extremely taboo topic. Um, and I'd like to see it um, tackled on stage and I don't see any better way than just showing it. Oh, and, um, but, why, but why would it have to... It doesn't, just because something needs to be, you know, it's questioned like, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be shown, like, in your face. It's like reality TV, though. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll, um, <laughs> yeah. Reality theatre. Yeah. yeah, I guess so, but... 
Mm, yeah. I see, I'm a really big Not, fan of live yeah. art and like using the body. But um, <laughs> yeah. the other thing that I would really like to see actually is um, more uh, East Asian representation on stage because mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, Chinese English. And th the reason that this is kind of at the forefront of my mind is because of um, there was a play that was um, to be put on at the print room um, oh, recently, yes. which is a Howard Barker play. I've actually completely forgotten the name of the production. It's called um, In the Depths of Deep Love. In the oh, Depths of Deep Love. Yeah, in love. the Depths of Love. Um, and it's a, a play set in um, China with Chinese characters, yet the whole cast were white and they yeah. were um, given yes. Chinese names. What do we think of that? Basically, that's like terrible. <laughs> I don't like that at all. Audience, there was like a big like um, protest about it, wasn't it? Like say no to. I like, went to that and there were some of the most creative face. signs I've ever seen. Like. Really? Um, there was somebody, because they were like, oh, we're just using China as an imaginary land. And there was somebody, <laughs> like a Chinese person there, with a sign that had an arrow pointing to them going, imaginary Chinese person. <laughs> and there was, there was another one that was like, in the depths of theatre practice, like, because the show was called In the Depths of Love. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really nice protest, actually. But then it kicked off because some of the audience came out and the audience were like all really old, crusty white people going, oh, yeah. <laughs> the other ones that are racist, isn't this just colorblind casting? No, uh, don't, no, it's just not. Don't. No, 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 no. Oh no. dear. No. And again, yeah, historicizing um, mm. minorities. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Definitely oh, like it's an, it was ancient China ancient as well, because ancient China is like a kind of like mythical land, like Narnia. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, but I think that protest, and you know what? It takes something like that, unfortunately, to really um, like boost momentum for some, for like you know, good to ch um, to happen and to impact change. So I actually think that because um, that protest and that campaign got loads of um, recognition in the media, I actually think that might end up doing some more good. Hopefully, because it's very much needed. Yeah. Can we talk about some favourite, more positive things now? So Sorry, yes. you get sad yeah. about the print yes. rooms, racism. Mm -hmm. um, so we've uh, we've asked the audience about all these questions about like what do you want to see more of? Oh. What are your favourite things in cool. terms of like from a kind of feminist perspective? Mm -hmm. So we've got like a big pile of post-its that the oh audience have thrust into our hands with recommendations of things that we should talk about or things they might want to let us know about. Um, oh, I'm just going through some of them now. Shall I just read some out? Yeah, do you want to read some of them out? And then if you've written one of them down and you'd like to talk more about it, oh, I don't know just it stick your hand in the air and then like, don't feel like you need to. But if you stick your hand in the air and let us know about something that we don't already know about or need to know more about, that would be really cool. Yeah, we should have a raving sharing mic somewhere. Learning. So if anyone does feel like sharing who their, their person is... Um, I'm just going to start with uh, <laughs> um, the first one I had was me, myself, and I. What's that? For whoever wrote that. No, I think they were referring to it's, themselves. Oh, oh really? Oh. I thought that was like is a it name of the film. Yeah, Isn't I just think Beyonce? of the song. It is, it is a Beyonce song. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a great one, whichever way that one went. Beyonce's a great one. I think she's on there. I think some, somebody wrote down Beyonce very early <laughs> yes. on. Yes. Obviously. Um, oh, Chimamanda. S somebody's yeah. written down. Who wrote Chimamanda? Oh, amazing. Do you want to explain who she is? Um, she wrote a really important book that you should all get because it's very inexpensive at Waterstones. It's like on the counter right there. I think it's like two quid um, called Everybody Should Be Feminist. And mm -hmm. it's great. And, and for me, it was just a really good kind of introduction into what I could call myself and helping with the language of broaching feminism. So I think it's a really nice introductory reading material for anybody who is new or just kind of wants to get some more academia under their belt and yeah very very important and very topical mm -hmm. yeah and it's it's also quite a small book like it fits yeah. in your bag and it's quite <laughs> bad. if you've got like Possible. a short attention span like me it's quite short but like yeah. you could read it like too, fully packed <laughs> yeah fully packed for the yeah. info thank you so much for recommending that that's amazing but yeah thank you so much um Nisa, life of a, I can't read Question that. mark, king woman. King is woman. That fucking woman. Oh, is that what that is? Is that what that's supposed to be? Cone woman. Oh, cone woman. woman. Life of a Sorry, cone woman. What's I that? Sorry, unnecessarily. Okay, so oh, oh, yeah. All okay. that's on. Um, so it's one of the first books that I read during my master's in anthropology. Um, it's an ethnography about a woman called Nisa. 
um, who is part of a community, a nomadic community in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I can't actually remember the anthropologist's name who wrote it, but I think that's probably a good thing um, because her voice must have come off so strong. It's um, essentially an ethnography about her life. Um, so it's, she told stories about her childhood, um, being weaned, her, her processes of going through womanhood, so menstruation, giving birth, menopause, her relationships. And I think for me it was um, kind of the first time I kind of reflected on my white privilege and that kind of started a journey for me of intersectional feminism so, and understanding it more. So, yeah. That oh, sounds very good. good. Well, We're going to put these all so good. Um, down outside as well so that people can, like, take recommendations. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, can I, can I take that one? Because I yeah. want to remember the name of that. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, everyone else can take the other recommendations, but, like, I, I think we should put these all maybe on a list on our website or something. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So you can access it. Um, I've also got Margaret Atwood. Who, who wrote Margaret? I haven't actually read any of her oh work, my which God, I feel really Pepper. bad about. Um, I but I do either, have Handmaid's Tale. I have it on my shelf, like oh, most people do. It's being made mm -hmm. into a film, you know. Well, actually, it's a television series. So oh, is Samira it? Samira Wiley oh, from Orange oh, is the actually, New Black. Wiley. <laughs> oh, my God. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, people are saying that um, in terms of The Handmaid's... Is that what it's called? The Handmaid's Tale, Handmaid's yeah, Tale, yeah, Margaret Atwood. Um, she wrote that the book. That's like very relevant right now because it's kind of like a dystopian. Mm. I started reading. I couldn't tell you specifically. I don't know who who mentioned Margaret Atwood, whose poster is this is. You might want to elaborate. Um, oh, is, is that you? Got something to say. No. Oh, yeah, please, please elaborate. Yeah. I'd like that to would be more. glorious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the Handmaid's Tale. So I always think it's a handmaiden, and it isn't. Yeah. So it's a dystopian future. It's very easy to see how, um, sorry, now I'm climbing up, <laughs> um, how our society could turn into it. Basically, it's, it's in America, and um, politics has gone so bad. There have been so many wars that um, very conservative religion has taken over, um, and it's very few um, very privileged men at the top and um, how they turn women into their kind of slaves. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not explaining it very well. It's um, a really No, good I've got, I've definitely wow. got more of an idea yeah. than it's about. But, but in a very subtle way, um, and it's very easy to see how what's happening now could very easily turn into what, what happens in the book because it's, it, it's very small steps and it's very small steps like the, um, the, the thing that Trump has just signed, um, taking certain rights away, and it's just the, mm. the, the peeling back and peeling back of certain certain things and um, silencing people and until the point that everyone's too afraid to speak up anymore because they just mm. can't. Everyone is just doing this, the status quo. Um, mm. And it's a really, really good book. Okay. I really um, like the sound, like the sound of that, especially because so many dystopian novels that I know that are famous are like your 1984's Brave yeah. New World, which is yeah. very centred on like a male protagonist as well. Well, Margaret Atwood writes quite a lot of kind of science fiction -y type books, yeah. which is, you know, uh, underrepresented realm is women in science fiction. But um, also like one of her books that I really remember growing up was Cat's Eye, which is about um, like childhood female friendships and how they kind of grow and and like bullying and kind of things like that. And that was really amazing. So like, if you know any teenage girls, get them to read Cat's Eye by Margaret Atwood as well as Handmaid's Tale. Okay. Um, were there any others? Someone wrote, sorry, I have to point it out. No, of course. Warrison Scher. That's another, I, I'm with you on that. She's an amazing poet. Um, yeah. Can we go she, back to that lady? <laughs> yeah, Who, I think we should go back to tell this lovely lady. Me, I've never heard of Orison Park. Oh, sure. you have to look she's her up. She's amazing. very good. Amazing. Um, so she's a poet, and just look her up on YouTube. Anything. Um, she's just phenomenal. But um, teaching my mother how to give birth. It's a really great collection of hers. But yeah, I have like a few collections of her poetry, and it's just phenomenal. And she teaches you kind of this fusion of different backgrounds. Because what is she's. Uh, English Somalian. Yeah, English yeah. Somalian. And also, like, randomly, when I used to live in Leighton, there was, like, plaques of, like, lyrics, for, well, not lyrics, like, words from her poems, like, just in the park and stuff. So oh. she's, like, very upcoming, and she collaborated with Beyonce on a lot of her albums. So really? Lemonade, like, all what the commentary. Yeah, she wrote... Poet from 
Yeah, yeah she I wrote think. like a lot of the yeah, like commentary in the visual album. So oh yeah, gosh, she's doing very about well. Her name, that's mm. amazing. Yeah. Thank you for picking that out. No, I just like saw so it out the corner of my eyes. Thanks for seeing it, Lakani, like, and thanks for writing about it down. that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Do we have time yeah. for any more? We, we've got time for like one more. Ooh, run like a girl. The campaign. It's not. Um, a, it's not a campaign. It's a book. A campaign. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was thinking of those adverts that are like. It's it's a book. <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, <laughs> that is a really good. That campaign. was the, very the girl nice, boss thing. Very interesting. That no, that's about. this girl oh. can is the oh. women in fitness campaign. Oh, yeah. Run like a girl I've is seen that one. Uh, Alex Hemingsworth. Hemings way? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I read it ages ago. But she is like a journalist who decided one day that she was going to start running, having never run before and like never even bought a sports bra or something. And then ended up running like tons and tons of marathons and extreme mm. like Ironmans and stuff. And it's, oh my God. it's, yeah, it's kind of about her like personal journey to like, mm. yeah, to what she found kind of cathartically mentally with running and a community of running as well like when she does races like with huge groups of other people like the kind of friendships that you make and the connection on like people who you would never meet in normal life you re meet like alongside the track in a marathon because yeah. you're like supporting each other it's oh, lovely yeah it's a really oh, good book great. run like a girl oh. uh, anyone else got any burning think... things that we didn't mention stick up your hand if you've got something you really wanted us to talk about otherwise we're going to recommend some theater shows because it's the theatre podcast. Mm. Oh, this down here. Thank, Thank you. you. I've been seeing quite a few shows here because I've also got a show uh, in a couple of weeks. But the great thing is there's so much uh, female-led work here, actually. The things I've seen so far have been brilliant. This is fantastic. I've got a show called The Singing Psychic in two mm. weeks here at the Vault Festival, which was award nominated at Edinburgh. And she's definitely passes the Bechdel te Theatre Test, not that I've ever thought Amazing. about that. But there's loads of it. There's so much great stuff that I just w want to imp implore everyone to come and see because there's great yeah. works being made. I haven't seen yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just c because then we do get voices heard and different views. Because I wrote yeah. Vagina Monologues because for me that's the... Yeah. It's the ultimate 360 of what the vagina does. So, um, but anyway, so yeah, so there we are. Vagina Monologues. Great. It's a shout out for events over there. Um, yeah, so we thought um, to wrap up the podcast, which is what we did in our last episode, is to um, specifically recommend theatre shows that we think are going to be passing the Bechdel test, but obviously we haven't seen them yet. They're upcoming, so we don't know. Um, but um, we'll yeah. take some of you. Lakani and Georgina will definitely come with us to see some of them. Yeah? Yes, yeah, for I'm sure. There. So uh, the number one on the list is Escapes Alone, Carol Churchill play, Returns to the Royal Court, and then it's Touring. That was definitely a highlight of last year, and it's spelt for women over 60, which is a bit of an underrepresented demographic in theatre. And it's vaguely post-apocalyptic. It, it's been kind of compared to Margaret Atwood a bit, so interesting. Ooh, oh, someone recommended that to me, actually. It's yeah. brilliant. And it's only 45 minutes long as well. Pfft. Genius. Best favourite is when a show is like under an hour. <laughs> yeah, no interval. Get in, get out, have a talk about it in the bar afterwards. <clears throat> um, oh, one I'm really looking forward to which, um, is called See Me Now at the Young Vic, which is Feb mm. to March, um, which is uh, true stories of London sex workers, which uh, are male, female, and transgender, and they're sharing uh, their stories, um, which is also uh, hilarious, but also touching and uh, oftentimes painful as well. Mm. Um, tickets are actually sold out for this show, um, but you can queue for returns. So I might see you in the queue because I really want to try and see it. Yeah, I need to talk to you about that because I want to see how I can do that. Yeah, because well, I've, I've, I've never done that. You just stand day. out in the cold and oh, like... There's right. always a way. No show is ever sold Bring out. A you can always get <laughs> tickets. Yeah, okay. definitely. Right. Uh, the next one is Bucket List, which is about a Mexican woman on a quest for justice and revenge after her mother is murdered for protesting. Protesting, very topical at the moment. That's happening all the time. Uh, so Bucket List is on at Battersea Arts Centre, 13th of Feb to the 4th of March, and then touring till the end of April. Um, also coming up is Brixton Rock, um, which is at Mangle Nightclub, uh, 15th of Feb to the 12th of March, which is um, about a care leaver living in a hostel whose life changes when he meets his mother and his half-sister. Um, and the Big House is a company that stages really high-profile productions with young people who have been in care. So um, I think it's a kind of another very important voice that we often don't see, and especially because mm -hmm. it's coming from the young people who have ex um, lived in care. Um, so we really wanted to plug that one as well, Brixton Rock. 
And then we've got Her Story Festival, which is a feminist theatre festival happening at Ballam N16 on February the 17th and 18th. It's a festival of new writing, creating a platform for political discussion and giving a voice to women. So it's all about the feminism. And it's actually the third time that they've done that at Ballam N16. So it's like an ongoing thing. It's not just a one-off, like, now we do the women and then never again. Can I it's, just say? It, it carries on. It was that, a, a mixture of that Her, Her Story festival and watching RuPaul, which made me realise that history is his story. So for anyone who hasn't had the pin drop on that one, I'm just telling you now, because <laughs> history is his story. He, his it literally blew my mind it's, when it's, I, it's, when it's, I figured it's out. It's also like <laughs> his, his white story as well. His, his white story. Yeah. So there's a show now like called Her, Her, Her story. story. Her Story. So it's like yeah. female his, history. Right. Um, Two-man show. I don't know if anyone saw it in Edinburgh. It was fucking amazing. Um, it? It's a Soho Theatre production, um, which is deceptive because it's not t two men, it's two women. Um, and another person, actually. And it's exploring masculinity on stage, but through the kind of female body. And it uses loads of physical theatre. There's the most incredible monologue towards the end of the show. Um, and it's by Rash Dash Theatre Company. And I really, really, really recommend you go see it. I also recommend Offside, uh, Four Women Across the Centuries, playing football by poet Sabrina Mafuz, who we'll be interviewing on our next episode, Tune In, and Holly McNish. That is touring throughout uh, March and April. Um, our oh, ladies. Um, our Ladies of Perpetual Sucker. I don't know if any of you came across this one. It was it toured, it was a Scottish production, and then it went to the National Theatre. And now it's got a West End transfer, playing at um, the Duke of, York, Duke of York's Theatre, um, from May, so it's a bit of a later one, but it's um, a story about uh, Scottish schoolgirls going on a trip to, is it Edinburgh? Or yeah, it's Edinburgh. Uh, going on a school trip to Edinburgh, and it's kind of like just complete chaos, and um, I don't know. It's lots just, of booze, lots, lots of, of booze, swearing. Lots of booze, lots of drinking, lots, lots of, of snogging. music. Um, and it was, uh, I loved it, I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Mm. I never got the chance to see that. Oh, it's oh, so yeah. good. Have to go. The yeah. tickets so went on sale yesterday, so oh. if you don't want to avoid the West End, like, Pricing out. Terrifying crisis that yeah. we encountered at Dreamgirls, yeah. then get a ticket in quickly. Mm. It was a Vicky Featherstone production as well. Yeah, Featherstone she's directed it. Um, oh, Bella Heesom, my world has exploded a little bit here at Vault until tw February 12th. Got to recommend that. Bella was here earlier. Yeah. I love the show. I absolutely adored it. And um, I guess to finally round up, um, you can see Lakani in Actors Jam at Oval House in, on February the 18th. And please, please listen to her podcast, The Creative Juice, which uh, she co-hosts with two other guys. Can I just say one thing? So um, at the Actors Jam, it's a variety of lots of different performances by BAME artists. And um, I'm doing a monologue, and it's called Can I Touch Your Hair? So <gasps> it's quite topical. So mm. yeah, I just wanted to like plug it so that people knew more about what I was going to be doing. Have you read Phoebe Robinson's book? No, oh, I haven't. Okay. I really recommend it to you. It's okay. called You Can't Touch My Hair. Oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's Brilliant. like lots I, yeah. of hair touching. I recommend like, that. What are you doing? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I really okay. Yeah, definitely go see that. Cool. And um, so that's Oval House, where Bella is also being an associate. Yeah, artist. so it's a great space. Yeah, Oval House gets a big, big up. And Georgina. Yeah, yeah. You've got a website, TV Jobs UK www.tvjobsuk.com <laughs> That is my website. What does um, it do? Basically, um, it's just got information about the business. Um, so you can go on there. If there's anyone out there who wants to work in television, please come to us because we basically deliver training. Um, Masterclasses, coaching, yeah, so CD, like, stuff, yeah, we do various We do various bits and pieces. We do coaching, we do one-to-one -one consultations. We write CVs and covering letters, and we also do training and masterclasses looking at how to write um, applications effectively for entry-level roles, um, interview techniques, et cetera, et cetera. So we just look at television and how to basically get into the industry at entry level. So if you're interested, check out Georgina's website. Yeah. Um, it's our time now. We're being called time. So we have to say a huge thank you to Bella, who's gone, Georgina on the end there, Lakani, and all of you in the audience. Can we all have a big round of applause for our guests? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you everybody for coming. Go and see some more shows at Vault.
Vault is festival is on until March the 5th. That's Vault Festival till March the 5th.